Welcome to this episode of Bounded in a Nutshell. Remember to take a moment to click on the link below to donate to a very special organization. Figure Skating in Harlem is the first organization in the world to combine the power of education with the grace and discipline of figure skating. It is dedicated to developing confidence, leadership, and academic achievement in young girls from low-income backgrounds. The numerous stories of success from its alumni owe a great deal to the unique blend of mentoring and self-expression that is championed by FSH. Remember, no donation is too small or too large to keep the dream alive for these exceptional young girls. Thank you very much. Enjoy the show. Welcome to Bounded in a Nutshell. Today, my guest is John Lithgow. John is a modern day Renaissance man, an actor, musician, poet, author, and singer. He's a Tony, Emmy, and Golden Globe Award winner and has garnered two Academy Award nominations and four Grammy Award nominations. The phrase best known for is somewhat reductive when describing his career, as the title keeps shifting with every award screen decade of his career. In the 90s, we had Dick Solomon in Third Rock from the Sun. The following decade, he gave us Arthur Mitchell in Dexter, and a decade after Winston Churchill in The Crown, receiving three of his six Emmys for those performances. He received his Academy Award nomination for his portrayal of Roberta Molden in The World According to Garp and Sam Burns in Terms of Endearment. His other film roles include popular and cult classics like Footloose, Harry and the Hendersons, Shrek, Interstellar, Rise of the Planet of the Apes, Pet Cemetery, and one of my favorites, Love is Strange. He, his on and off Broadway appearances include Sweet Smell of Success, Dirt and Rotten Scoundrels, King Lear, and Hillary and Clinton. He's the author of several children's books and has released several children's albums as well. He's the author of the New York Times bestseller, Dumpty, The Age of Trump in Verse, and is currently working on the sequel due out next year. Ladies and gentlemen, John Lithgow. Hello, John. Hi, Chuck, and hello, everybody. <laughs> it's so fabulous having you here with us. So um, we've got a lot of guests, and we're going to have a lot of questions at the end. So let's just dive in, shall we? Can you tell us a little bit about where it all began? Princeton or something, was it, where you were born? Or? Well, no, uh, the, Princeton uh, uh, showed up in my itinerary. <laughs> my father was a, uh, a somewhat itinerant a producer of Shakespeare, mainly in the Midwest when I was a kid. He created uh, the Great Lakes Shakespeare Festival, which is now the Great Lakes Theater Festival in Cleveland, but also uh, the same festival in different forms in, uh, at Antioch College in Toledo and Akron. He was finally hired to direct the uh, McCarter Theater in Princeton. That's when I ended up in Princeton. Right, okay. Oh, I lived in eight different places. We were a gypsy wagon growing up uh, and a sort of on and off again theater family. So that, those were my beginnings. I, I was going to be an actor whether I wanted to or not. <laughs> because your mother was also in the industry, right? Well, not really in the industry. She just was the, the sort of facilitator for my dad. Uh, right. She, she acted when I was a, a little boy, before I even remembered, I never even saw her act, but she just sort of, she kept us fed and housed all through a very, <laughs> very crazy childhood. Correct. And so you say you were always going to be an actor. So I'm going to just jump forward a bit because, I mean, you followed through on that and studied in Lambda, correct? Yes. How did that come about? Well, I went to Harvard uh, and... I, you know, I, I almost immediately fell in with the theater gang. I hadn't intended to be an actor growing up, even though I was acting all the time. Mm -hmm. I was much more interested in being a painter. I was actually very uh, committed to that. But I showed up at college and I was cast in a big role in a big production like two weeks after I arrived. And I, I sort of instantly became a campus star. <laughs> I was already a, an experienced actor and not many undergraduates were. Mm -hmm. By the time I was finished with Harvard, I, the handwriting was on the wall, I decided. So I auditioned to get a Fulbright. Back in those days, the Fulbright, there were two Fulbright grants given to a, a young man and a young woman to each go to Lambda to their one year D group program is a program for over foreign language, I mean, overseas students, most of which were Americans. 
And I was two years in London, sort of absorbing a, a British academic theater training and came back to work for my dad, by that time head of Princeton's McCarter. And that was, that was the very beginnings of my career. Fabulous. Now that clearly something happened in London that gave you a deep connection to theater over there as well as here. I mean, when I first met you in person, we were both at the Royal Shakespeare Company. Uh, mm -hmm. You were doing, you were about to do Malvolio, correct? That's and, correct. And I was in the history cycle and we met randomly at Vintner, that wonderful restaurant, Vintner, and, and spoke for about two hours. And I'm there thinking, That's stay cool, stay cool. This is, you know, the, you know, it's, it's John and he's just so open, you know. Um, tell us a little bit, I mean, was that your first time at the RSC, that, that job? Yes, it was the first time I had done a, a theater job in England mm -hmm. since I had done student theater at Lambda like 45, 50 years before. Uh, and I had been over there to do four or five film projects, but I'd never done stage. Mm -hmm. and, you know, I, I guess mainly on the basis of Third Rock from the Sun of all <laughs> They thought, what a bright idea uh, to have John come over and play Malvolio. And I, it was a dream come true. I said yes in an instant, even though it completely upended everything else. Mm -hmm. uh, and we did the show. It, it was interesting because I didn't join the repertory company for no. months the way you did and the way mm -hmm. most actors have to. Uh, I was there just to play in one play. And it was during the period when they were renovating the big theater. So they yeah. were doing single runs in the courtyard theater, straight runs. Yeah. Yeah. So it was a lucky chance. I got to do a major role with the RSC all in the space of about three months. Uh, and uh, it was just a glorious experience. I'm going to come uh, circle back to playing a comedic, I mean, there's a lot of tragedy in Malvolio, but a comedic role because uh, Am I, am I wrong in saying that a lot of your early career, at least that we know of, I mean, I think of, you know, was more dramatic roles. I mean, um, there was the, I mean, playing what you did in uh, World According to God, playing Roberta Molden, I mean, was, uh, was quite extraordinary. Playing an ex-football player, a man who's become a woman, in that incredible play but a lot of your stuff had been drama and stuff i and then let's imagine that we fast forward to third rock from the sun because I, I often think as dramatic actors i'm terrified of stepping into a room with people that i think are really funny i almost had a nervous breakdown in the low road with some of those incredible hilarious max baker and harriet harris and you know active comedic actors was it something you leaped into without trepidation or was it something, am I wrong? Had you had a, quite a bit of comedic training before that, you know, as an actor? Well, I mean, the fact is, I just told you my background that it started with Shakespeare. Uh, by yeah. the time I was 20, I had been in about 20 different Shakespeare productions mm -hmm. for my dad, always in tiny roles, very often zany character roles, you know. I yeah. was, Hortensio and Pinch and uh, 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 all these sort of ones, points and yeah, know, yeah, yeah, these little journeyman character roles. And I always figured, I mean, as I've grown older, it's occurred to me Shakespeare both wrote and performed with a theater company, and he wrote in every conceivable. Uh, genre, he, you know, as he, he put words into Polonius's mouth, comical, mm -hmm. little historical, pastoral. Oh. <laughs> On any given night, an actor in Shakespeare's play could be in Hamlet or, or Comedy of Errors. Yeah. Beth or Merry Wives of Windsor or Henry V, the history play. Uh, all, and in any given cast, there are quite serious moments and quite zany comical moments in his mm -hmm. Beautiful romance. He he loved to mix it up, and night by night, any working actor worked in a very very different mode. So I, and in a sense, my whole career it's been like that. 
so I, yes, I've done a, a very serious film like Love is Strange, but mm -hmm. the next thing I did was Daddy's Home too. Yeah. <laughs> and Third Rock from the Sun and Dexter in close succession. I mean, those were my two big television roles prior mm -hmm. to and the crown itself. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it has come in, certainly come in handy for me as an actor to just simply extend my career. Because honestly, nobody knows what. Do you, do, 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 do you think of it in terms of dramatic versus comedic? Or do you just think of it in terms of this is the character I'm playing? You know what I mean? Well, it's a combination of both. But I do think it's quite wonderful to blend comedy and, and anguish. Uh, to me, playing the, the role of Roberta Muldoon, it, it was such an extraordinary experience. I mean, most of your students here are quite young. Probably don't know. <laughs> it may be before your time, but, but you should see this film. It's an extraordinary it's amazing. film from and 40, the book. 40 and years the book. ago and very much ahead of its time. But I played a transgender woman who'd been a professional football player. In fact, a... Uh, and uh, a left Heisman Trophy winner and all that stuff, wasn't it? Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, the, so the, my first appearance, and I was acting with Robin Williams, a man who has both comic and very serious tones to his uh, palette. My first scene was had big laughs in it. My second scene, I burst into tears because I couldn't have children. It was a very serious moment, a very tender moment. Mm -hmm. All from that moment on, all through that film, there was always this sort of potential for both grief and hilarity in that role. I absolutely love playing parts like that. Mm. Of course, you always invoke Chekhov as a guest. Yeah. He always call, he called all of his plays comedy. Yeah. And have you done, have you, has, have you done a lot of Chekhov? Not a lot. I, as a matter of fact, the most Chekhov I did was while I was still in drama school. Mm -hmm. I do you have a role you want to I my dream I, I'd love to have a go at Trigorin. Um do you have a, a check of yeah. Anya well now I've, I've outgrown all the younger roles <laughs> Ostroff and Vanya are both fantastic roles yeah, uh, yeah. yeah Trigorin is a great part but I'm too old for that now I, it's uh, I'm, I'm in the Soren category <laughs> 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 crabby old men no. And so, I, uh, yeah. it's a shame that I haven't done Chekhov. I've, I've always, I've always loved his work. Um, and I've never, I've actually never done a Chekhov play professional. Funny enough, yeah. I mean, they, they're always part of our lives because they feed you Chekhov and you go see them and whatever. But as well, I was just thinking about it the other day, and I've actually never professionally done Chekhov. Yeah. you know, I and mean, I'm you sure you're missing it. something. But you did in drama school, I assume. I did. I did. I played Astro in drama school in yeah. both, both uh, his um, um, Uncle Vanya and also the Barker's Vanya. Yeah, uh, you heard it? Yeah. It's, it's an amazing. I mean, it's, it's basically all the characters were playing their inside story on the outside. So it was quite yeah. extraordinary. So I, I did those two together. So it was quite extraordinary to have that experience. So right. let's let's um, move on to um, you 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 played these incredible roles, like a monumental role, like you know um, Roberta and Third Rock from the Sun and all that. Then suddenly, um, let's sort of talk about coming to the RSC, almost coming back home uh -huh. from when you went to school in Lambda. Yeah, and we yeah. were just talking before we allowed our guests in to sessions with Cicely Berry, mm -hmm. the legend that is Cicely. I mean, what was that like for you and actor? Your first theater gig in it, it it was, at the RSC. It, was, and, it you know. was absolutely wonderful. First of all, it was a six week long rehearsal period in London before we went up to Stratford. It was down there in uh, Clapham at that mm -hmm. studio down there where just everybody has worked. Uh, it was a wonderful cast. Uh, Olivia was played by a marvelous actress, uh, Justine Mitchell, mm. and a dear friend of mine ever since. Uh, it, it, I don't, it, it was like going back to Lambda. It was just yeah. completely thrilling. It was like putting to work everything that we focused on with such intensity back at Lambda. 
every rehearsal began with a warm up, a vocal warm up. Uh, we had vocal coaches, we had movement coaches. It, uh, every performance began with a vocal warm up on stage. But you are open to all this. It's very important for people listening I, is that this it, stuff is out there if you're actually open to it. You oh, know? Yeah, it, um, was, it was like red meat to a tiger. And <laughs> it was so much like the London experience. The, mm. There was the same. I went there on, I went down to clap. I was living up in, uh, in, Hampstead, but I took the right. two both uh, to the rehearsals, and uh, it, it was just I was poor. I, I basically lived poor as a church mouse, like all other London actors, and just mm -hmm. immersed myself. It was a terrific company. I, mm -hmm. I and then I had a very the equivalent the experience with the National Theatre. National, yes. About just seven years later. Uh, in a wonderful Victorian farce, The Magistrate. Yeah. And there again, uh, you know, the, 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 you work in theater in London and it's like you're joining this enormous club repertory company. Everybody yeah, yeah. With has already worked with everybody else in the cast. Yeah. Extraordinary collegiality and comradeship. A lot of it having to do with geography. Yeah. English actors have the great advantage of working in radio, television, film, and theater all in the same city. Right. Uh, we are but I think a big part of it also is the fact I always feel one of the difficult things of being an actor here in, in, in America versus England and a lot of Europe is that when you graduate from school, you're sort of cast out into the world. That, whereas in England and stuff, there is that sense still, I mean, diminished, but still that sense of apprenticeship. You disappear, yeah. you could disappear into the RSC for the next 10, 15 years, play small parts, whatever, but you're, you're working and you get to know people or you disappear into the company at, 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 the, at the Sheffield Crucible or the company at you know, Bristol Old Vic or the company yeah. at the National. There is that apprenticeship thing yeah. that an actor has between their early 20s and late 30s or even 40s where you can get to know these people and be part yeah. of that group, you know, that doesn't really exist here. That's right, and it is yeah. it's a hardship for young actors in America, I think. I, yeah. Yeah, I, I remember I went a couple of years without getting a prayer, not a, not a whisper of a job in New York for about two years. Uh, and then I, sort of, I had my Broadway debut, I won a Tony Award, suddenly I was in the, in the, in the pool of hireable actors, mm -hmm. and very well, and then I went out to Los Angeles for the first time. And it was like completely starting over. Nobody wow. knew or cared about anything I'd done in New York theater. Nobody had heard of me. Uh, and you just feel completely unstrung. There's no connection. In, in so many ways, there's no connection between the two. Things have changed a little. I mean, this was back in the early 1970s. Uh, but, uh, you know, a lot, a lot of Juilliard actors are immediately uh, film stars mm -hmm. the, uh, the 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 sen people are have a much better sense of what's going on in New York and what's going on in Los Angeles mm -hmm. but in those early days they were they could have been two different countries tell me a little bit just want to touch on it because like I you know I mentioned to you and I've said to the viewers we know John Lithgow we know the guests coming in we know we like, I sometimes feel um, things like this shows like this are like looking at an album, the pictures in an album, we only see the smiling pictures, but there's a lot of life in those, in between those pictures. Can you tell me a little bit about John Lesko struggling before, do you know what I mean? And, you know, you were married and, you know, you had, you know, and family and, and being an actor trying to make decisions yeah. and all that, because it's hard to believe that, because like I said, you've been this ubiquitous, figure being a Harry and the Hendersons my whole life as a kid from growing up yeah. in Lagos to walking into the room to acting with you in Leah. I mean, but do tell us about those gaps between the pictures, you know? Yeah. Well, I, I, I told you a little bit about how things started. I, I always felt that I had had a little bit of a head start growing up in the theater family. Mm -hmm. And I 
loads of actors and I knew the whole experience of working in professional productions, but it all changes when you're an unemployed actor in New York and, and you haven't had any work there yet. You know, I worked, I drove a taxi. I, my, the closest thing I had to a job was doing part-time work on WBAI radio, doing radio satire for like $75 a week, collected unemployment. Uh, it was about a two year period. Ironically, the most success I had in that two year sort of uh, in the wilderness in New York, I, I, I had directing jobs. I had directed for my dad at age 27 when I came back from London uh, full of my, I, I was, I'm sure <laughs> extremely pretentious. I was full of my British training. I even had a horrifying British accent that I didn't, <laughs> didn't even know I had. But I, I, had, I had directed for my dad. I directed three big productions of uh, English classics, uh, Much Ado About Nothing, As You Like It, and The Way of the World. Mm. So a little bit of a resume as a director and people caught wind of that. And I got hired for a couple of major regional theater directing jobs. I directed the Bow Stratagem for Baltimore Center wow. State. And they invited me to join as an associate artistic director. Uh, this was before I'd had a single acting job in New York. Wow. I didn't want that job, but I took it because I was completely unemployed. Mm -hmm. And then two weeks later, I finally got a job to join the acting company at Long Wharf Theater. Uh, and I pulled out of, my, uh, out of that directing gig and spent an entire season at Long Wharf. And the second show I did there came to New York. And that's where, that was my debut that won me in my Tony Award. So <laughs> wow. I, was a, I, was, I was a hireable actor. And within, I directed another couple of times and then just, uh, that was the last I ever directed uh, because he was a successful actor. Yeah. And I literally haven't been out of work except when I wanted to ever since then. So that was a very lucky start after a very tough couple of years. You can't avoid those tough years. Mm -hmm. you prove to people that you're, you're capable. Once you've done that, you're a known quantity and you at least have a shot at roles. Uh, one of my guests down the road is uh, uh, going to be Richard Jenkins, who, you know, yeah. you probably know, and Richard is so funny he's talking about his years, many years, I mean, almost 30 years, predominantly struggling doing theater. Yeah, and, and, in, very, and, and, in, and, in, and in regional theater at that. A regional theater, not even in the city, and so, but Trinity then he Square. makes this explosion appears, and he goes, yeah. people don't know, I mean, don't know about those 30 years in, in that way, way. And, but what I love about your story is two things. You did mention luck. There's very, a lot of words about for luck, you know, you know, mm -hmm. your left providence, whatever you want to call it, but there is that thing that you can't control. But secondly, was a decision to give up, to, to gamble with the security of an associate to, to do another yeah. acting game. Not yeah. for a lot of money, and not for you didn't know where that show was going, but you followed genuinely. You know, you looked at it as to uh, to you know you to thine own self be true. If we're going to quote one of the greats, do you know what I mean? And you knew what you wanted to do. Yeah, and you can't really yeah. lie to yourself too much, can you? About you couldn't pretend you'd have been happy just. Yeah, people. I mean, I mean, everybody who's joined us today, uh, Chuck, all you pictures. I wish I could talk to all of you instead of just talking at you, but you're all there because you know the rush of acting, you know the thrill of it. Uh, and to me, if you get the chance to, to act terrific roles with terrific people, there's really nothing better than that. Uh, I mean, I could have been a director by now. I mean, I could have directed my entire career. Uh, I've had the chance to direct films. Uh, but, uh, you know, there's something, the, 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 the creative rush of actually telling a story, of actually doing something for an audience and feeling that connection. I always feel that this, deep down, that's what directors wish they had too. 
<laughs> I feel that what I do is a, is a really enviable gig. Uh, and and it's, it's the thing in my life. Uh, That's wonderful. Professionally. Fantastic. Um, um, let's talk about one of the things. Well, so obviously we're going to come back to Leah and stuff like that. But love is strange. I mean, what a beautiful... Yeah. You know, as actors, you get gigs and gigs, and someone like you, you you've got so many gigs. But I remember you talking to me about that one. Uh huh. I mean, yeah. it was it seemed it was... really special with Alfred. Mul I mean, who's the, just an yeah. extraordinary actor. Yeah. Tell me about not uh, one of the the people watching today talks about the imposter syndrome. I often have it as an actor and stuff. You know what I mean? But tell me about. I mean, that was a very I mean, vulnerable role for yeah. you to take on, you know? I think it's, it's, Chuck, thank you so much for bringing it up and focusing on it. I, I'm, I'm, I'm sure that everyone, uh, there's probably two or three of your students today who've actually seen Love is Strange, but I urge them all to find it. It is an, an absolute jewel of an independent film. It was co-written and directed by uh, Ira Sachs, who's one of our real treasures. He's a, he, he only directs what he really wants to direct and they tend to be small independent films. It is the story of two old men, two old gay men who've been together for 40 years and they finally get the opportunity to get married. Uh, very early on in the first scenes of the film, they lose their apartment because one of them, the part were played by Alf Alfred Molina, he's a music teacher at a Catholic school and because of their doctrinal rules, he gets fired for being in a gay marriage. And so they lose their only income and they have to live apart until they get things back together again and get to move back in together. That's basically the entire premise of this film. And it is so sweet and tender and funny. And uh, it, 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 it sort of, the, it was right in the heart of the zeitgeist because it was just at the very moment when same sex marriage was finally uh, uh, sort of sanctioned. Ira directs in a way that literally I, nobody has, <laughs> I'd never worked with anyone like him. I, it was such a relief. And I sort of knew it when I read the script. The script was so simple and unforced. I remember meeting with him and I said, Ira, I'm so thrilled to work on something where I don't have to act at all. In fact, what he said to Fred and me more than any other thing was, okay, now no acting. This time do it, but no, no acting. And at first, both Fred and I had the separate experience of, because we began, we didn't begin acting together. He started first and I joined a couple of weeks later. Both of us, the first time we worked with Ira, we bridled at this, like, how dare you? What do you think I do? <laughs> but very, very soon we sort of went on this journey with him. It is the most unaffected, relaxed and unforced acting I've ever done. And you just see it. And it is such a moving film. It uh, really is. It really is. And it's on Amazon Prime for people who want to catch oh, I'm it. Oh, I'm glad to hear that. Because I, I really do urge you to see it. It's, uh, and since I'm sort of your subject today, it is a different kind of acting than you see me do in Third Rock or Dexter or Churchill or uh, bombshell it, it, there's no acting involved and uh, and in fact some of the best acting I see on film is exactly that yeah that's let's talk about that a bit because <laughs> a lot of my guests have been people who have had a lot of theater and come into film and TV and almost every actor wants to know what is that transition what is it it's not just about speaking softer john you know what is how do you how how do you i mean for someone to come to you and alfred is a huge theater person also and very loud and real character you know actor like yourself to then let it go but that doesn't mean don't do anything i mean yeah. is there a little 
jewel nugget of advice you can drop in, which could change on a daily basis, but for today, what that advice might be about that transition? Well, it, it is a tricky transition to go from exclusively theater to home for the first time, uh, mainly because nobody tells you what to do. They just, nobody tells you any of the rules. Uh, I, I always, whenever I work with someone I know has been hired because he's made an impact in the theater, but he's never done film before, I immediately take that person on, under my wing and I explain to him or her about the, like a, a master, a two shot, an over the shoulder, a close up, uh, what a dolly grip is, what a focus puller is, what the difference between the gaffer and the grip, because it's a big bewildering sprawl of people and nobody tells you what they do. You just come in and act and you're dealing with this whole new discipline, which is mainly about dialing down and being, and being less theatrical. But unless you're in the hands of a very, very sensitive filmmaker who knows what you're going through, you're basically ignored and you don't know what you're doing. <laughs> uh, it's, and you learn very, very quickly because it's not rocket science, it's a very simple thing. Uh, one of the most rudimentary things of all is to realize if you're gonna, if you're gonna shoot a three minute scene, it's gonna take you all day and you're gonna play that scene about 80 times so that you don't have to worry too much about getting it right. <laughs> Uh, eventually, you're going to get every single moment in that scene. <laughs> and if there are, and if you have maybe uh, 30 lines in the scene, if, if it's a big scene for you and you have 30 lines, when they finally cut the film together, you will only be seen speaking about five of those lines. The rest of the time, you'll be off camera and they'll be focused on somebody else. So you don't have to worry too much. Hmm. The way I describe it is when you're doing film, all you're doing is offering up raw material to a director and his editor. When you're doing theater, you're completely in charge of your own performance. You're doing everything. So you can relax a little bit. Uh, you're, you're bound to be very, very insecure at first if you're working for the first time in film or on television, but go ahead and be insecure make good use of that insecurity, insecurity, because the camera is there to capture those moments when you don't know what you're doing. You know, some of the best work you do on film, you didn't even know you did, or it was a mistake. And somehow or other, they've managed to catch a moment of absolute reality. I take you back to Ira Sachs, when mm -hmm. he had no acting. He never even wanted us to say the lines until we were in front of the camera. He says, I, I, don't want to, I, don't want to, I don't want any sense at all that you've said this before. Now, he takes it to an extreme, and he was one of those sensitive actors, who knew, uh, directors who knew what he was doing. Hmm. But you have to create that for yourself. And very, very often you are on your own, because a lot of film directors pay no attention at all to the actual process of acting. That's really, I mean, really, I love that idea of... Uh, catching you when you think you've made a mistake or when you're not yeah. in the moment and stuff and they, and they use that. I mean, some of the best, I, I remember the, <laughs> my first film, funny talking about, but I remember the director telling me one time, there was this crazy movie called Exam and there's this bit where all hell is breaking rules around me and I'm doing my moment to moment acting. And the, the director says, can you do me a favor, sir? Can you just, when I say action, all I want you to do is, is just look down to your right. I was like, why? You know, he said, no, just, just look down to your right. So I did it. Just look down to where I cut. Best moment in the film for me. Yes. <laughs> it was, right. Because with everything that happened, and in the trailer, there's that shot of looking to the right. I was like, damn, best moment, the only moment in the film I can watch, because I find it very hard to watch. The only moment in the film I go, oh, wow, yeah. And I remember yeah. that moment specifically was like, just, just do it. <laughs> no, no, it's, well, as I say, you're offering up raw material. The, yeah. Another cause on that very subject, I worked with George Miller in one of my early films, the Twilight Zone film. George Miller, the Australian director, 
who did Mad Max Fury Road, the Road Warrior, uh, fantastic filmmaker. Lovely. He was the first film director to completely unleash me. He was the first one to ever want more instead of less. Uh, I never, whatever I did, he wanted more, you know, and sure enough, it's a very over the top performance, <laughs> but it's about being panicky on an airplane that's about to crash. So yeah, yeah. Like, suited. I, I haven't yeah. seen that one. I'm going to have to catch Oh my that God. I, that's still one of the best things I ever did on film. Oh, but great. I'm going to search it out. If you haven't seen it before, you've got to see it. I'm going to see it. Look for okay. a moment. Okay. There, there was a speech I had that was supposed to be punctuated by lightning. Yeah, and yeah. Exactly when the lightning should hit in the course of this speech. I sort of had worked it all out. And as I did the speech, whoever was in charge of that got it all wrong. So they were, he was constantly breaking me up and sort of breaking up the speech and taking me by surprise and shocking me. Well, that, of course, is what they used. Uh, and I, I did it. I was very, very frustrated. <laughs> The way I planned it. So, yeah, the way you planned it. One of my very to... first film performances. So that was a lesson. A real lesson of spontaneity. But I want to move on to that extreme of no acting to Leah, mm. where we first met at the, well, not first met, second time we met at the public. I mean, amongst other things, a brilliant performance. I mean, a great, a lovely production by Dan Sullivan. Tell me about what it is for an actor to come to the decision to say yes to Lear. Do you know what I mean? Well, you know, until I played Lear, I'd been asked a hundred times, is, is there any role that you especially want to play? And the only role I could ever think of was King Lear. Uh, that was like my bucket list role. And Oscar uh, Eustace asked me to do it. And I said, yes, in a heartbeat. Uh, uh, particularly, Dan was involved. I'd worked with Dan had I worked with him yet? I guess it was the first time I had worked with him, but I absolutely, no, no, I had worked with him once before and I loved him, I loved him. And I'd seen so many of his Central Park Shakespeare productions and they are, they're marvelous. Yeah. It's a perfect pitch. So everything about it was like all the ducks were in a row. I mean, Lear is, I had seen Paul Schofield play it I'd seen Christopher Plummer and Eric Porter, uh, uh, Derek, uh, I'd seen all sorts of Lears. Uh, I'd actually played Gloucester when I was in college. Oh, wow. Yeah. And it was like, it was my big breakout role in college. Uh, uh, everybody said, wow, he should have been playing King Lear. King Lear. Yeah. <laughs> by, uh, I think everyone, everyone that plays Gloucester and Kent <laughs> wants to hear that. They want people to say you should be right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Lear was played by a, a Shakespeare professor who got play who got to play all the big roles. All right, and everybody said, "Oh my God, you should have been King Lear." So, <laughs> Eighteen years old, so I, I was. It was a sort of rendezvous with destiny. Uh, I spent the entire spring learning, just learning the role because I knew the hardest thing about it was going to be pure stamina. I couldn't. Mm. I couldn't get behind on actually playing the scenes. Uh, the, I was surrounded by a wonderful cast, including you, Chuck. And, and sure enough, Dan, working with Jim Shapiro, uh, our dramaturg, we spent the first week just sitting around. Table, yeah, table one. Table. It was sort of during that period, I think, that I devised my, my own little personal private uh, philosophy of acting Shakespeare, which is to pay attention to three things, the meaning, the emotion, and the music. To me, those are the three legs of the stool. In Shakespeare, Shakespeare was a poet, of course. Um, most of his major plays, the major passages in the plays are written in verse. He only breaks into prose when he has the sort of the, the common folk speak. <laughs> kings, kings speak in verse until they go mad and then they speak in prose too. Uh, so you pay attention to the way, the, to the beautiful poetry of Shakespeare, but you can't only play the poetry. 
first of all, meaning is absolutely essential. And that's what that week with Dan and Jim Shapiro were all about, making sure you absolutely understood the inside of every line, exactly what was being said. And then, of course, as soon as you get up on your feet and you start acting, <laughs> you forget it all. Then, then emotion kicks in. <laughs> yeah. so, but you can never forget that you're speaking poetry, meaning, emotion, and music. And and if you pay any any attention, if you pay attention to the great to the great Shakespearean performances, you'll see that they never those actors never let any one of those things take over. Take yes. From the and they don't let any one of those things follow the other. They're all simultaneous. And yes. it's not like you, you, you make sense and then you coat it with the poetry and then you coat it with the emotion. Or it's not that you first find the emotion before you, you just, you do it. And those things, like they sort of intertwine with each other that way. And the big problem is trying to let one be the starting point. Because a lot of, I, I find it really difficult sometimes working with actors that have trained a lot here in the States and in Meisner and techniques like that led by, and I go, all that stuff can exist, but you, if you start there with this, yeah. you're gonna lose one of the others. I've never seen it put in those three things, but that pretty much rounds it all up in many ways, you know? And mm -hmm. the other thing is that, which Kristen Linklater points out is the imagination, which is yeah. then is sort of like the Uber the Uber driver of all that stuff, the, the world yeah. you imagine in your head. John, on that note, shall we give um, our viewers a, a, a little treat? You came up with a wonderful idea today, and uh, we're going to do a scene, Act 1, Scene 4 from King Lear. I'll play all the other parts, and John is going to give us um, a bit of Lear, and then we'll go on to questions after that. So. Yeah. Where do you want to, let's go from uh, Enter Goneril. Now let's, let me see, let me find my moment. Yes. Uh, uh, who, who comes here, oh heavens? Is that? Uh, where, where is that, who comes here, oh heavens? If, uh, uh, who comes here? Just oh, how now, daughter. If you, yeah. Um, Wait a minute, are we in the... Around line 194, so it says, enter Goneril. Uh -huh. Yeah, Great. let me start with, um, who comes here, oh heavens, if you do love old men, okay? Uh, okay, let me find that so I know where you're at. It's just before Goneril comes on. Who's okay. my servant, Regan, I have good hope thou didst not know it. Who comes here, oh heavens? And then you go, do then say, how now, daughter? How now, daughter, what makes that front let on? Have I got the right scene? Uh, I'm in act two, scene four. Oh, you're in two, scene four. I was in act one, oh, scene four. Oh, no, no, no. That's our problem. Oh, okay. It's a big, big scene. I, I It's a hell of a scene. <laughs> I, I mean, I thought... I, I, I was like, oh, no, we're in the wrong place. So you want act two, scene four? Yeah. yeah. Hold on a second. I... I, I, I I referred to it in my note as the serpent's tooth scene. Serpent's tooth, yes. Because Sorry, I lay I... into Goneril. It's the scene where where Lear completely breaks. It's yes. like too many things are piled on. First, great. So yeah, let's. Uh, take... Where do you want to go from? From. I'll just say, uh, who comes here? Oh heavens! If you do love it... men. Enter, enter Goneril, it's halfway yes. through. Okay, Leah and Gloucester, hold on. I'm just finding the right. So do you, do you have a line number roughly where it is? Uh, 191, I believe, or just Great. Like that. Great. All right. You see, we did not rehearse this quite yes, often. Yes, this is all, this is all. <laughs> and, and, all right, go and, for it. Um, and Chuck, Chuck will play Goneril and... Yes wall and all sorts of different parts but I it's yes. the what, what I find fascinating is it's this incredible mixture of anger and grief and panic and fear of going mad it's the moment when when he breaks if you remember there was a moment where I simply screamed when I said oh reason reason not the 
Yes, need. Yeah. Yes. And I, won't, okay. I won't scream today. Just listen <laughs> to the meaning, the emotion, and the music. Okay? And Chuck will play all the parts. Go for it. Who comes here? Oh, heavens. If you do love old men, if your sweet sway allow obedience, if you yourselves are old, make it your cause. Send down and take my part. Art not ashamed to look upon this beard? Oh, Regan, wilt thou take her by the hand? Why not by the hand, sir? How have I offended? All's not offense that indiscretion finds and dotage terms so. Oh, besides, you are too tough when you're yet old. How came my man in the stocks? I set him there, sir, but his own disorders deserved much less advancement. You? Did you? I pray you, Father, being weak, seem so. If till the expiration of your month you will return and sojourn with my sister, dismissing half your train, come then to me. I am now from home and out of that provision, which shall be needful for your entertainment. Turn to her, and fifty men dismissed? No, rather, I abjure all roofs and choose to wage against the enmity of the air, to be a comrade with the wolf, an owl, necessity's sharp pinch. Return with her? Why, the hot-blooded France that dowerless took our youngest born, I could as well be brought to knee his throne and squire-like pension beg to keep base life afoot. Return with her, persuade me rather to be slave and sumpter to this detested groom. At your choice, sir. I prithee, daughter, I do not make me mad. I will not trouble thee, my child. Farewell, we'll no more meet, and no more see one another. But yet thou art my flesh, my blood, my daughter, or rather a disease that's in my flesh, which I must needs call mine. Thou art a boil, a plague sore, an embossed carbuncle in my corrupted blood. But I'll not chide thee. Let shame come when it will, I do not call it. I do not bid the thunder bearer shoot, nor tell tales of thee to high judging Jove. Rend when thou canst, be better at thy leisure. I can be patient. I can stay with Regan, I and my hundred knights. Not altogether so. I look not for you yet, nor am provided for your fit welcome. Give ear, sir, to my sister. For those that mingle reason with your passion must be content to think you old. And so, but she knows not what she does. Is this well spoken? I dare vouch it, sir. What? Fifty followers. Is it not well? What should you need of more? Yea, or so many, since that both charge and danger speaks against so great a number. How in one house should many people under two commands hold enmity? Tis hard, almost impossible. Why might not you, my lord, receive attendance from those that she calls servants, or from mine? Why not, my lord? If then they chance to slap you, we could control them. If you will come to me, for now I spy a danger, I entreat you to bring but five and twenty. To no more will I give place or notice. I gave you all. And in good time you gave it. I made you my guardians, my depositories, but kept a reservation to be followed with such a number. What, must I come to you with five and twenty, Regan? Say you so? And speak it again, my lord, no more with me. These wicked creatures yet do look well favored when others are more wicked. Not being the worst stands in some rank of praise. I'll go with thee. Thy fifty yet doth double five and twenty, and thou art twice her love. Hear me, my lord. What need you five and twenty, ten or five, to follow in a house where twice so many have a command to tend you? What need one? Oh! <sighs> Reason not the need. Our basest beggars are in the poorest things superfluous. 
allow not nature more than nature needs. Man's life's as cheap as beasts. Thou art a lady. If only to go warm or gorgeous white, nature needs not what thou gorgeous wearest, which scarcely keeps thee warm, but for true need. You heavens, give me that patience. Patience I need. You see me here, ye gods, a poor old man, as full of grief as age, wretched in both. If it be you that stirs these daughters' hearts against their father, fool me not so much to bear it tamely. Touch me with noble anger, and let not women's weapons water drops stain my man's cheeks. No, you unnatural hags. I will have such revenges on you both that all the world shall... I will do such things. What they are, yet I know not, but they shall be the terrors of the earth. You think I'll weep? No, I'll not weep. I have full cause of weeping. But this heart shall break into a hundred thousand flaws, or ere I'll weep. Oh, fool, I shall go mad. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Back memories. Memories. Oh. That's right, the serpent's tooth was in that first scene. <laughs> yes, it was, he says it to yes, in the first scene. That's why I thought that was the scene. But now, what all I just want to- But all your I, students, I hope you've paid attention that Chuck was just reading all of that for the first time, for the very first time. That's how good yeah. he is. <laughs> but it's funny, I was gonna make a note on that because that, the structure and verse, we drum it, people think of verse and they think, oh God, this thing that's gonna lock me up and stop me. Literally, I was able to read that the first time following the verse lines, you know, and yeah. stuff. And you were able to reconnect with it. It was something layer more than almost any other character does. This. When I think of how, how, yeah. how, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Sounding it, but following that verse line, because you were, you were reading it also. But how much work Shakespeare has done for us in many ways in the text, you know? Yeah, yeah. No, I, uh, people very, very often ask, what is the hardest role you've ever played? And I always say the only hard acting is bad writing. Shakespeare <laughs> does it all for oh, you. With for you. There. Beautiful. John, I could talk to you all day, but we have to open up to questions. I'll have a mutiny on my hand. So okay. Michelle is going to start feeding us some of the questions that have come in since okay. you're right, Michelle? Yep, ready to go. Um, okay, this question is for from Kyle. How did you train for Cliffhanger when you were doing that film? Well, Cliffhanger was a perfect example of just being thrown into something where you did not know what you were doing. <laughs> I'll never forget. I'll never forget. You want to kill me, don't you? Well, pick a number and get in line. I remember that. <laughs> yes, I mean, it, it was full of all those cornball action movie. As a matter of fact, I was cast in another role, and like a week before, uh, Christopher Walken dropped out, and I took his role, and an actor named Rex Lynn took mine. I mean, that's, and I remember deciding what nationality I was, literally a day or two before we started shooting. And we they allowed you to decide, they allowed you to pick whatever you wanted? Yeah, uh, well, I mean, it was, it was, Rennie Harlan was our director, who's a, who's Finnish. Mm -hmm. You can tell the difference in our accents. <laughs> uh, but, you know, we were talking about him being an American Secret Service agent or, or then being South African, a sort of special ops character or English, you know, and, uh, and if, if he's English or so where he is on the English uh, social hierarchy, this was a conversation two or three days before. <laughs> I mean, that's that's how <laughs> how seat of the pants that performance was. Um, oh, it was great. 
the the big the big action of that film was the action. There's no question about it. But boy, was it fun! I, I mean, just it looked fun. I watched that movie at Yale, undergrad at Yale, at the movie theater. You know, the movie nights on Friday. Yeah. And I remember watching that movie. And that line I quoted from you got the biggest laugh because it's that knowledge of we know we're watching popcorn, but it was <laughs> delivered so deliciously. Yeah. You know, <laughs> it, was, yeah. Yeah, it was so much fun. And we were really up on the top of the Dolomite Mountains in Northern Italy for two months. We were there. We were doing a lot of that stuff. And then we spent two months down in Rome at Cinecittà doing all the close coverage of what we'd done up there. So it was four months in Italy, during which I worked about maybe a fourth or a third of the time. Uh, and and that it was country. a heaven job. I always say it was the coolest job I ever had. <laughs> and I, I got to do a big, violent action fight with mm -hmm. Sylvester Stallone. Oh, it was uh, awesome. You know, I was in a film, uh, This is 40, a Judd Apatow film, and I got to improvise with Albert Brooks. Mm action scene with Sly Stallone and improvising with Albert Brooks. That's like top of the food chain. <laughs> Brilliant. All right, next question. Uh, okay, so this next question is actually my question. Um, but so how do you approach the characters in Bombshell and Beatrice at dinner that you know are gonna be very unlikable characters? Oh, that's a very good question. Um, it's, um, I always say, if you play a villain, and there's no question Roger Ailes was the villain of Bombshell, I, I always feel like I'm on the, the, whatever character I play, I'm sort of on that character's side. You just try to understand what drives them, what their needs are, what their compulsions are, and very often at least give them the, be compassionate enough to your character to at least contemplate whether or not they wish they didn't have to behave this way. When I played the Trinity killer in Dexter, my entire uh, device in playing that diabolical character who was a, a sadistic serial killer uh, who led this double life was to think of him as somebody who is in the grips of a compulsion and deeply wished he was not, wished he did not have to do these things, even wished that there would be somebody who would stop him. And that made it into a very interesting double, a sort of double pull in the character. To me, the great, the great word is duality. Look at the two sides of a person, of a person's nature and how very often those two sides are in conflict with each other, particularly if you're playing a villain. And, and in, the, in the role of Roger Ailes, that devastating scene with, with Margot Robbie, which is the kind of a linchpin of the whole film, I played that scene almost with a kind of anguish. Of, of, uh, at least that was my intention to... Mm -hmm absolutely deeply humiliating her uh, and manipulating her and taking advantage of her and feeling so ashamed of himself for doing it. To me, that, that made it into something more than just a villain. Great. Yeah. Great, great question. It was, definitely felt like there was a lot of anguish in that scene. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, okay, this next question is from Erica. What is the biggest lesson slash tips you've learned on how to stay consistent through the many changes our industry have gone through throughout the years? That's another very good question. Uh, what I always say, and I'm so glad I had a chance to say it to all of you who are much younger than I, and you, you basically, I'm sure most of you are in the early stages of your career. Think of things in your life that are more important to you than acting. This seems like curious advice, but it's in the nature of our profession that you have to wait until someone wants you. You have to wait until someone hires you before you can do what you most dearly want to do, which is act. You have to wait and it can drive you crazy if all you're doing is waiting. 
What I tell young people is find things in your life that are all yours, creative things that you can do whether you're hired or not. And I have followed that advice my entire career. Uh, you know, what, what I'm doing, a sheltering in place over the last five or six weeks, I'm finishing a book of satirical poems about the Trump administration, uh, a follow-up to a book called Dumpty that I published last fall and was a New York Times bestseller. I didn't have to do this. It never even occurred to me to do this. It was, it was my literary agent's idea last year, but it was something that had nothing to do with acting. So I could do it whether or not I was acting or not. And it's consuming, it's creative, and it's all mine. And there are lots of things, you know, if you're interested in painting as well, go ahead and paint. Or if you always wanted to learn to tap dance or play the guitar, go ahead and do that because those things belong to you. You're not please, sitting around and waiting. And, and, and you can even make yourself a project. If there's a role you want to play, figure out a way to produce it. Uh, or if you or or write a play and uh, you try writing, write something for yourself to perform. Make your make that your project. Make that your aim. Chances are you will never never get there. You'll never accomplish it. And the reason why somebody will hire you to act instead, and you haven't been waiting around for it. So. That's great. Great answer. Yeah, that's Go really on. great advice. Um, this question is from Opal. Have you ever thought of giving, giving up this acting pursuit? And if so, what kept you from giving up? Uh, well, that's a lovely question. I've thought about uh, simply stopping and doing nothing but painting, like taking a sabbatical, uh, because I, I love to paint and I don't give myself enough time or a chance. Uh, but you know, it's what I just described. The reason I don't, the reason I've never done that is because I'm always being asked to act. Uh, and, and I find it impossible to say no to really good projects. Um, so that's the, only, that's the only thing that I've ever thought about doing instead of acting. Uh, I do lots of other things. I perform for children, for instance, and I write children's books. Um, but none of those are the primary, my primary ambition. My primary ambition is always to do good work in good writing with good people. And I get the chance to do that. Yeah, definitely. Okay, this is gonna be the last question. Uh, this is from Julian. While you're performing, what are the things you think about to ground yourself in your character? Is it different from screen to theater? Well, I, it's more, theater and film are more similar than different. But of course, in theater, you have to sustain it over the course of two hours and you have to, you have to compel an audience's attention for all that time. Uh, I don't really know, I don't even know how to answer that. I don't have any strategies. Uh, basically, by the time you open a play on stage, you know what you're doing. You know where the laughs are, if it's funny. You know when you want to shock the audience or when you want to move them. And you have figured out various ways of doing that. Uh, if it's a musical, and I've done a couple of musicals, you absolutely have to be right with the orchestra uh, or right with all the other dancers if you're dancing. You have a sort of technical superstructure that keeps you very, very focused. And part of your mind can wander. Part of my mind does wander, but you can absolutely count on me to say my line when the time comes. I know Michelle, that's great. I know Michelle said this is the last question, but given that we gave John a couple of minutes to be brilliant, I do have one more question. Doing Leah, I have one more question for you, John, because we, we talked about this. When you, I remember getting an email from you when you were about to take on Churchill in The Crown, mm -hmm. and you clearly in the email were that thing we had to sometimes feel when we say yes to a role and then suddenly we're confronted with having to play them going, holy sh, what was, you know, you know um, fear, a little bit of fear, a bit of trepidation. And it's incredible. It's one thing feeling that 
straight out of drama school to play Hamlet. And it's another thing feeling it with your career and suddenly being given yet another TV role. So my question for you is that, how do you approach fear as, as the actor you are, you know? I, I have learned that the parts that I'm afraid of are always the great experiences. Uh, you know, you're, very often you're asked to do a part by someone who has more faith in you than you have in yourself. Stephen Daldry figured I could play Churchill and be original and unusual and surprising in the role. So the fact that it was coming from Stephen and because it was a fantastic role in a fantastic series, of course I said, yes, and there's no way I was ever gonna uh, sort of succumb to fear and pull out of it. Mm. It just had faith. And I was extremely excited if I was, I, if I was afraid, I was excited in equal measure. And that's the best possible com combination because you're being challenged. You're being, you're being given the chance to do something you've never done before. And uh, that's, that's very, very special. And the other thing is you rely on your collaborators. When I put together Churchill, I had Michelle Clapton, this brilliant costume designer, I had a marvelous dialect coach uh, helping me, not just with Churchill's dialect, but also with his character and physiology of his mouth. Uh, and uh, and every, everybody, this incredible makeup designer, uh, uh, Ivana Primorak, you just rely on all those people. No role is performed just by an actor. You go, you finally perform something and you're carrying a, a team of about, about 10 people who have all supported that moment. And you, you know, you just rely on all of them. By the way, Taj Jahara, I see, is watching today. I know <laughs> Taj got me through King Lear by helping me just, I, 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 I was racked with pain uh, performing that role because it was so incredibly strenuous. I couldn't have done it without her. You just look for the great collaborators, not to mention the fact that you rely on the people you're acting with. Mm. In, in the case of King Lear, I spent about 20, uh, 20 30, maybe 40% of the time relying on Chuck Iwuji. <laughs> and it was one of the true joys of my whole acting career. John, this conversation has been amazing. We're deeply grateful. And if Michelle's there to unmute people to show their appreciation, you can all show your appreciation to John unmuted now to yes. say thank you for- Thank you, John. Thank you. 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 Thank you so much. We work together sometime. John, I often say to young people, if, if you're a young actor, we're going to work together sometime. And about a dozen people over the years have said, you know what? You told me outside the stage <laughs> door. We <laughs> are. Oh, that's so awesome. Well, I hope I hope they get the same privilege that I, I did working with you, John. Good luck with your new book. Good luck with the painting. Awesome. Love to the family. Please stay safe. And thank you very much for this.